स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया हेलो एवरीबॉडी वेलकम टू द कोर्स ऑन प्रिसिशन ऑनकोलॉजी वी आर कवरिंग द टॉपिक ट्यूमर माइक्रो एनवायरनमेंट इन द लास्ट लेक्चर वी सॉ व्हाट इज ट्यूमर माइक्रो एनवायरनमेंट व्हाट आर द कंपोनेंट्स ऑफ ट्यूमर माइक्रो एनवायरनमेंट हाउ ट्यूमर माइक्रो एनवायरनमेंट इंटरैक्ट्स विद द ट्यूमर एंड हाउ द ट्यूमर प्रोग्रेशन इज डिपेंडेंट अपॉन द ट्यूमर माइक्रो एनवायरनमेंट टुडे we are going to see how to target the tumor micro environment now tumor micro environment we saw is comprising of a lot of different types of cells so today we will see how to target the ecm the extracellular matrix hypoxia and acidosis neovascularization immune system chronic inflammation activation of anti tumoral activity exosomes cancer associated fibroblasts combined therapies which are acting very effectively in targeting the tumor micro environment and nanomedicines along with this we will also look at certain models to study the tumor micro environment as we all know cancer development is highly associated with physiological state of tumor micro environment we have genetic alterations which happen in the tumor cells which result in hyperplasia and leading to uncontrolled growth and resistance to apoptosis actually there is a metabolic shift towards anaerobic glycolysis which we call as the warburg effect in warburg effect is otherwise called as the aerobic glycolysis where the cancer cells are transforming significant amounts of glucose into lactate and atps so here when cancer cells undergo glycolysis they produce a lot of lactate irrespective of whether oxygen is present or not to meet their energetic demands this warburg effect gives the cancer cells advantages for growth as well as for survival now there are a lot of cascading effects which happen because of this warburg effect if you look at the cancer metabolism in the normal cells the normal cells undergo glycolysis and they undergo the oxidative phosphorylation in the mitochondria but maybe in cancer cells the mitochondria are injured or they are faulty in mechanism the cancer cells are using an alternate mechanism that is they kind of have an increased mechanism to undergo glycolysis which happens in the cytosol and not in the mitochondria and they convert the pyruvate into lactate so therefore the increased glycolysis in cancer cells leads to excess production of lactate there are a lot of cascading events which happen because of the warburg effect in the cancer cells now these events that is because of an excess production of lactate there is a region of hypoxia which is formed and also an increased acidic environment which is formed that is these events the warburg effect creates hypoxia oxidative stress and acidosis within the tumor micro environment and which trigger an adjustment within the extracellular matrix so there is a response from the neighboring stromal cells that is fibroblasts and immune cells and the uh, lymphocytes and macrophages and therefore a lot of uh, different kinds of arrangements which happen within the tumor micro environment which pushes the environment towards neovascularization angiogenesis and metastasis now the picture here shows the different components of a tumor micro environment now the cell the cartoon a that is it is a 
tumor micro environment of a late stage solid tumor so you can see that it is highly heterogeneous and complex you have several different types of cells which are present in this tumor micro environment you have the normal cells and the tumor cells and the whole the atmosphere is highly heterogeneous and it leads to the formation of desmoplasia now coming to the component b that is the cartoon b within the tumor micro environment you also have exosomes these exosomes play important role in paracrine and autocrine communication between the tumor micro environment cells and they are preponderant in modulation and in development of tumor the exosomes are also involved in transformation of the normal cells adjacent to the tumor micro environment into tumor cells so you may have different types of exosomes like you may have the exosomes which are from the uh, it derived from the immune cells derived from the stromal cells so from the normal cells every single type of cells which are present in the ecm will be forming different kinds of exosomes and all these exosomes have extensive communication in the tumor micro environment now coming to the cartoon c now this c here picture shows a rapid growth of the tumor cells which results in hypoxic regions due to lack of nutrients when the tumor cells rapidly proliferate they need blood supply so when the blood supply is limiting due to an excess proliferation it leads to the area of hypoxia that is less oxygen and the lack of nutrients within the tumor which will again cause warburg effect so there is a metabolic shift to the anaerobic glycolytic pathway which leads to acidification of the tumor micro environment as we saw due to an excess of lactate production the acidification increases within the tumor now coming to the component d the cartoon d here shows the vascularization of the tumor micro environment when there is rapid growth of tumor cells this will induce angiogenesis and it actually leads to formation of chaotic branching structures within the tumor cells the stromal cells which include the cancer associated fibroblasts and the mesenchymal stromal cells and cells from the immune system which belong to both lymphoid as well as myeloid lineage they are all important players in this tumor micro environment now let us see how we can target the tme the tumor micro environment as we all know chemotherapy is the leading cancer therapy worldwide and it is often combined with other modalities of treatment like surgery or surgery and radiotherapy which will all depend upon the tumor stage and there are targeted agents which are available to treat these days for example a lung cancer which is egfr mutation positive can be treated with a suitable target similarly tumors which are over expressing her2 can be treated with a targeted agent so therefore these targeted agents are available for specific mutations and over expression however they also have the property of developing this multiple drug resistance the mdr this mdr can lead to tumor relapse and poor prognosis so therefore after certain period of time the targeted agents stop acting because of resistance which is being developed at a late stage of a solid tumor the tumor micro environment is highly complex and it is highly heterogeneous so initially the genomic profiles of the tumor cells are preponderant for the modulation of the tme as we all know ecm is basically a 3d structured uh, component which is comprising of collagen elastin fibronectin hyaluronic acid proteoglycans and glycoproteins that support the tissues by encapsulating the cells and providing hydration and tumor homeostasis so the whole thing is in a 3d environment and now we will see how to target each of these components now this is a tumor cell 
So with all the different components there, you have the lymphoid lineage cells, the tumor associated macrophages, the cancer associated fibroblasts, the mesenchymal stromal cells, the normal cells and the tumor cells, everything is present in the TME. Now what are all the different ways in which this can be targeted? One could target the extracellular matrix. We can target the tumor cell derived exosomes. We can target the chronic inflammation or the tumorogenic factors which are supplied by the adaptive immune system. We can have targets which can avoid the neovascularization, which can we can target the endothelial cells or the pericytes, targeting the hypoxia and the, and the acidosis which is associated, targeting the cancer associated fibroblasts, activating the anti-tumoral activity of an immune system is possible. And we can also inhibit the macrophages recruitment and differentiation. So the whole lot of these things are possible with drugs and small molecule inhibitors is possible today. And that's exactly what we will be covering in today's lecture. The heterogeneity of tumor cells, the lack of tissue oxygenation or increased inflammation in the TME can induce modifications in the ECM protein components which can lead to increased ECM density and stiffness and which is arising mainly from the increased amount of collagen deposition. So this property is called as the desmoplasia which is very common in a late stage tumor. Now there are several studies especially the one which we have, we have highlighted here. This is a study which was done on multiple myeloma which talks about a heparinase inhibitor called as the ronipastat which was found to be effective in this multiple myeloma therapy. Now the ECM composition plays important roles in tumor progression by providing tumor cells with sustaining proliferative signals, evading the growth suppressors and resisting cell death and enabling the replicative mortality, inducing angiogenesis and promoting invasion and metastasis. So there are angiotensin receptor blockers, what we call as the ARBs. So there are several ARBs which are useful in treatment of hypertension and diabetic neuropathy and studies have shown that there is a considerable preclinical evidence that ARBs can effectively reduce cancer progression and particularly to gastric cancer. So there are ARBs like Cantesartan, Losartan, Olmesartan, Valsartan. So these are some of the ARBs which are useful to treat hypertension but they have shown some effect in the uh, reduction of uh, progression especially for several cancers but studies have been shown positive for gastric cancer. Now ARB users in the study which was reported by Busby et al, I would request the listeners to kindly go through this publication. They have shown that ARB users had a moderately low risk of gastroesophageal cancer mortality than the non-users with a hazard ratio of 0.83. Similarly, the, the Ronispatat, which is a SST, which is otherwise called as the SST, 0001. This is a, again another heparinase inhibitor which has completed a phase 1 clinical trial for the treatment of multiple myeloma. That is the reference which has been shown in the slide. So there is the clinical trial number is also given. I would request the listeners to kindly go through this particular clinical trial where promising results have been shown in inhibiting the tumor growth when used alone as well as in combination with other TME targeting agents. Similarly, as we all know, a tumor microenvironment comprises of enzymes, the proteases, the degrading proteases called as the matrix metalloproteases. There are several drugs which are available which target these MMPs. Earlier, the MMPs, the pan MMP inhibitors were found to be very toxic. Whereas these days, there are several small molecule inhibitors, MMP inhibitors, which have shown promise. Several drug targeting MMPs have been developed. For example, incyclinide, which is also known as the CMT3 
or COL3 is an MMP inhibitor that has gone through several clinical trials for advanced carcinomas. The clinical trial numbers are shown in the slide for people to read and understand. So there are the structures of several small molecule inhibitors are shown in this slide. So the molecule A is called as the 10D, B is S17B, C is JNJ0966, D is NSC405020 and uh, E is doxycycline, G is minocycline and H is ND336. So these are the structures of some of the small MMP inhibitors which are found to be clinically very promising. Now after targeting the ECM using the ARBs and the heparinase inhibitors, let us move to targeting the hypoxia and acidosis. The figure here shows the oxygen level. The normoxia regions are from 45 mm to 35 mm. Now, hypoxia region is from 0.02 mm Hg to 35 mm Hg is the hypoxia region in a tissue section of 100 to 200 micrometers. Now, below 0.02 m will be the necrotic region. So, when the blood supply is limiting, when the tumor cells are rapidly proliferating and when the blood supply is limiting, then within the tumor, this hypoxic regions are formed. This hypoxic areas create a, a very conducive atmosphere for expression of a protein called as the HIF1 alpha. HIF1 alpha is a molecular determinant that is upregulated as an adaptive response to alterations in the tissue oxygenation. So whenever there is a shift in the tissue oxygenation, the HIF1 alpha and HIF1 beta can get expressed. The tumor hypoxia induces adaptive responses through enhancing unfolded protein response that is UPR mediated upregulation of other proteins like ATF 6 XBP1 and ATF 4 which in turn can inactivate the mTOR pathway. We will be seeing all this in little more detail in the subsequent slides. So the severe and the functional abnormality of the tumor vasculature an increase in the diffusion distances between the blood vessels leads to intratumoral hypoxia. So this is the message that I want everybody to understand from this slide. Now as I mentioned in the previous slide, in the hypoxia, that is if you compare the tumor edge and the tumor core, in the tumor edge, the amount of oxygen availability is high compared to the tumor core. And that is why we say that the tumor core is hypoxic. Similarly, if you look at the acidic environment, the amount of proton ions will be more in the core compared to the edge. So therefore, less amount of oxygen, more amount of acid leads to the hypoxic region. And then, so when there is a shift from the normoxia to hypoxia, there are a lot of metabolic reprogramming which happens within the cell. So there is this heat shock protein activation, there is a lot of endoplasmic reticulum related stress and GRP expression which is induced by hypoxia, there is HIF1 mediated transcription, generation of cancer stem cell like cells are more in the hypoxic region and then autophagy, there are altered signaling, secretion of exosomes and altered epigenic regulation epigenetic regulation and energy metabolism related reprogramming happens in the hypoxic region. Now what happens in a normoxic situation? When the normal concentration of oxygen is maintained, then what happens is the HIF1 alpha protein gets hydroxylated. When the hydroxylation happens at position 402 or 4, 564, what happens is there is another protein which is called as the von hippel lindau protein which can bind to this hydroxylated forms of HIF1 alpha and this leads to ubiquitination of the HIF1 alpha protein and the protein gets degraded.
Similarly, there can be a hydroxyl group getting added at the 803rd position which will also alter the conformation of the HIF1 alpha in such a way that it will prevent its interaction with the P300 and CBP transcription factors. This is what happens in the normoxic situation where this VHL protein is able to bind to the HIF1 alpha and degrade it. Now what happens in the hypoxic situation? In the hypoxic situation, there is a lot of phosphorylation, deacetylation and chaperoning by uh, HSPs which happen which lead to an excess of this HIF1 alpha and HIF1 beta production. And due to the chaperons, the heat shock proteins functioning as chaperons push this HIF1 alpha and beta protein into the nucleus. So here you see the HIF1 alpha and beta are entering into the nucleus. Now in the DNA, there is a pro there is a region which is a HIF1 responsive, uh, responsive element, HRE. Now this responsive element area is bound by the HIF1 alpha and HIF1 beta. And this in turn is bound to the P300 family of proteins. And this complex, this ternary complex can lead to excess target gene expression. Now let us see what are the genes which get expressed in response to this HIF1 alpha and beta. So you have several angiogenic factors, erythropoietin and its receptors, the glucose transporter regulators that is the GLUT molecules and all the enzymes which are necessary for glycolysis are expressed. And then all the regulators of autophagy, regulators of apoptosis and cell cycle, all the genes which are necessary for these pathways are produced by the HIF1 family of uh, proteins. So therefore, when the, uh, you know, these signal transduction pathways are activated, these in turn can again lead to cascading effects of metabolic reprogramming which hop happens through the Warburg effect. There can be autophagy with mitophagy which can lead to resistance to apoptosis. So all these components, the cascading events lead to radio resistance and chemo resistance. That is any hypoxic area in the tumor will make the tumor resistant to any kind of therapy. Similarly, in a tumor environment, there can be a, there can be a lot of changes pertaining to immunosuppression, pertaining to angiogenesis, pertaining to metastasis and treatment resistance. So let us understand how these things happen. Within the tumor microenvironment here, as I showed you here, there are the tumor cells. Now these are the new blood vessels. You have the macrophages and then you have the tumor associated macrophages and the T cells interacting with the TAMs. So all these can lead to uh, the immunosuppressive environment. So for an immunosuppressive environment to happen, you will have a decreased number of cytotoxic T lymphocytes, but there will be an increase in the T regulatory cells and increase in the tumor associated macrophages and decrease in the PM and leukocytes. So these kind of phenomenon will lead to an immunosuppression in the tumor microenvironment. Similarly, for angiogenesis, when you have increased number of blood vessels being formed, it could be because of increased amount of cytokines like increased IL-8 or increased VEGF which are released by these tumor cells themselves will lead to neovascularization that is production of new blood vessels. So this will contribute to the angiogenesis. Now coming to metastasis, when you have excess MMPs in the extracellular matrix. Now they can lead to degradation of the extracellular matrix and also increased amount of hyaluronic acid can lead to metastasis within the TME. So these factors are important to promote the metastasis. And as I told you, due to the Warburg effect the uh, and the glycolytic pathway going getting converted from pyruvate to excess conversion of lactate will lead to an acidic environment within the tumor that is the pH maintenance between 6 and 6.5. Now let us see how these promote to treatment resistance. So when you have decreased amount of ROS, 
decreased amount of HDAC and then uh, a lot of other changes which happen within the nucleus which can alter the DNA repair mechanisms that is the cell's DNA repair capacity seems to go down which can lead to more number of mutations therefore the genomic instability within the tumor will also increase leading to treatment resistance. Now let us see how there is repression of oxidative phosphorylation which happens. Pyruvate dehydrogenase PDH it is a mitochondrial enzyme which is responsible for conversion of pyruvate to acetyl CoA and this acetyl CoA will enter into the TCA cycle. Now HIF1 alpha induces expression of the pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase 1 this is another uh, enzyme. This gene which encodes a kinase enzyme which will phosphorylate and it will inactivate the pyruvate dehydrogenase enzyme. So therefore, there is no production of acetyl CoA and therefore this can repress the oxidative phosphorylation and this in turn prevents the aerobic respiration. Increased production of lactate. So this increased production of lactate in turn along with over expression of proteins like carbonic anhydrase 9 and carbonic anhydrase 12 are also regulated by HIF1 alpha directly and therefore this also promotes acidification of the tumor microenvironment. The acidic environment decreases the proliferation of the polymorphonuclear leukocytes and CTL cells, the cytotoxic T lymphocytes and it increases the recruitment of the TREC cells. Now, the secretion of cytokines and the chemokines will also attract monocytes which will enable them to differentiate into macrophages or this is what we call as the tumor associated macrophages. The tumor associated macrophages or the TAMs express a ligand receptor called as the PDL1 that inhibits the function of the T cells, T cells that is the cytotoxic function of the T cells is inhibited by the PDL1. We will be seeing the mechanism shortly. And the macrophages, the tumor associated macrophages, will induce inflammation. Now, these mechanisms are important to generate an immune suppressive environment in the tumor microenvironment. So, elevated lactate will also boost the interleukin 8 and VEGF to facilitate angiogenesis. So, we see that how much a pH change within the TME can disturb the homeostasis. The increased angiogenesis coupled with an acidic tumor microenvironment will lead to degradation of the extracellular matrix and expression of hyaluronic acid which will support the tumor cell migration and metastasis. The lactate efflux will activate the metabolic substrate, substrates and also leads to transcription of genes which are involved in metabolic rewiring to influence the tumor's ability to respond to radiotherapy and the chemotherapy induced DNA damage. So, the points that we need to remember is that the activity of the HIF1 alpha, how it plays a role in acidification of the tumor microenvironment and what happens as a consequence of this acidification and how the immune uh, atmosphere of the tumor microenvironment is suppressed and what is the contribution of the elevated lactate towards angiogenesis and what happens when there is an increased angiogenesis and what happens when there is a lactate efflux which in turn alters a transcription of lot of genes which are responsible for metabolic rewiring promoting uh, you know a tumor uh, poor response and poor prognosis due to these environments within the TME and how these can be targeted is what we are learning today. In this slide what we are seeing is are the GLUT transporters, they are glucose transporters. So there are several types of uh, uh, glucose transporters, they are called as the GLUT, the GLUT1, the GLUT3 and through which the glucose enters into the cytoplasm and this is the normal glycolytic pathway that we have learnt in our early classes. So, glucose getting converted to glucose 6-phosphate in the presence of hexokinase and from glucose to fructose, glucose 6-phosphate to 
fructose 6-phosphate is due to an isomerase enzyme and then there is another the phosphofructokinase another rate limiting step of glycolysis which leads to another phosphoryl group being attached to the fructose 6-phosphate it becomes fructose 1,6-bisphosphate uh, and this in turn splits to uh, to, that is one molecule of glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate and one molecule of dihydroxyacetone. So, therefore, the subsequent steps of glycolysis leads to conversion to pyruvate, two molecules of pyruvate and this then in the presence of uh, lactate dehydrogenase becomes lactate. So, therefore, the pyruvate to lactate conversion is mediated by this enzyme. In the case of a tumor micro environment, what we see here is the PDK1 which is formed as a result of HIF1 alpha is inhibiting the pyruvate dehydrogenase step and so therefore the pyruvate to acetyl con CoA conversion does not happen and therefore this leads to uh, you know loss of the TCA cycle. The TCA cycle does not happen and then along with that the other players are the COX and then the other uh, uh, oncogene MYC which is in turn uh, can lead to um, uh, transcription of several genes which are important in the process of oncogenesis. Now, let us see how this HIF1 can be inhibited. Now, thankfully, there are a lot of HIF1 inhibitors which are available and they have been very successfully used in several clinical trials. So, first important HIF1 inhibitor is the topotecan. This topotecan is a topoisomerase 1 inhibitor and this is an FDA approved inhibitor and it has been shown to be useful as a second line treatment for ovarian and small cell lung cancer. Topotecan has been studied in a clinical trial for treatment of refractory advanced solid neoplasms expressing HIF1 alpha. So, in tumors which uh, over express HIF1 alpha, Topotecan has found to be useful. So, this is a clinical trial. So, one can go through this uh, clinical trial website and identify and, and understand this trial. Now, basically, this topotecan is a synthetic uh, derivative of the campotecin, which can show the anti tumor effect by inhibiting the topoisomerase enzyme. So, there is a ternary complex which is formed by the topotecan and along with the topoisomerase enzyme and the DNA. So, all three together form a ternary complex. This causes breakage of the DNA double strand which is irreversible and eventually leads to cell death. So, this is the mechanism by which topotecan acts. Evaluation of metformin. Metformin also has been very useful because it is an mTOR inhibitor and uh, this has been found useful in head and neck squamous cell carcinoma and this is the clinical trial number shown here. There has been a phase 4 trial study uh, which has studied the uh, effect of everolimus. This is otherwise called as the RAD001 in patients with advanced renal cell carcinoma. So, this is the clinical trial and there has been a phase 2 study for the effect of everolimus which is conjugated with lenvatinib. So, both together everolimus as well as lenvatinib together in renal cell carcinoma and there has also been a phase 2 studies looking at the pharmacodynamics of digoxin along with HIF1 in a, in a newly diagnosed operable breast cancer. So, there are several uh, trials which are going on uh, uh, with these HIF1 inhibitors in place. Everolimus is a derivative of rapamycin which acts as a signal transduction inhibitor. Now, as I mentioned, this is an mTOR inhibitor. That is why uh, like metformin, everolimus also seems to work because it is an mTOR inhibitor. It targets mTOR which is a key protein in regulating cell growth, proliferation and survival. The mTOR activity is actually modulated by the phosphatidyl inositol 3 kinase, the PI3 kin protein and uh, PI3 protein kinase and the AKT pathway, a pathway which is known to be deregulated in most of the human cancers. So, this PI3 kinase, protein kinase, B and AKT is a very important pathway and therefore, this is modulated by the mTOR. 
So the RAD001, the trade name is called as the Affinitor. It has been investigated as an anti-cancer agent and based on its potential to act directly on the tumor cells, inhibiting the tumor cell growth and proliferation and also indirectly by inhibiting the angiogenesis. So it is able to act both directly and in indirectly. Directly it inhibits the tumor cell growth and proliferation and indirectly it leads to reduced tumor vascularity and uh, with this is the vascularity is decreasing because of the uh, 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 repression of the hypoxia inducible factor that is it represses the activity of HIF1 and the VEGF production and VEGF induced proliferation of the endothelial cells. So it is able to act directly this way that that way the RAD001 has shown extensive promise. Now this is the pathway it shows how this Evrolimus and, and there is also another uh, derivative which is called as the Temsirolimus, both of them inhibit the mTOR. So normally you have the tyrosine kinase receptor and the growth factor. So normally when this growth factor binds to the growth factor receptor, this leads to the induction of the phosphotidyl inositol 3 kinase and the AKT pathway and the mTOR and the downstream molecules are this S6K1 and uh, the 4 EBP, these in turn can enter into the nucleus and modulate the gene expression leading to proliferation, cell survival and angiogenesis. And this Evrolimus is able to inhibit the mTOR at this pathway. So therefore, the pathway can get shut down at this point. Evrolimus is approved by the FDA for the treatment of patients with advanced renal cell cancer after failure of the treatment with sunitinib or sorafenib. So, it is already FDA approved and this is the structure of the Evrolimus. And Evrolimus binds to the FKB12 forming a complex that inhibits the mTOR kinase activity and it reduces the downstream activity of the S6 ribosomal protein kinase 1 and the eukaryotic elongation factor 4E binding protein that is what is this 4EBP. So, Everolimus has been shown to inhibit tumor cell proliferation and angiogenesis with the latter which is mediated by the inhibition of the hypoxia inducible factor 1 alpha expression. Now, after we have seen how HIF1 alpha can be targeted, let us see how we can target the acidic tumor microenvironment. As we saw, the microenvironmental acidity may differentially impact the diverse components of the tumor immune surveillance, eventually which can lead to tumor escape and cancer progression. So, the main important mechanism here is the tumor immune surveillance fails. The anti-tumor effectors like the T cells and the NK cells, they tend to lose their function. They undergo a state of a reversible energy which is followed by apoptosis when exposed to a low pH environment. So, in a low pH environment, the T cells and the NK cells lose their function and they undergo apoptosis. The immunosuppressive components such as the myeloid cells and the regulatory T cells which is the TREGS as we saw are engaged by the tumor acidity to sustain the tumor growth while blocking the anti-tumor immune responses. Now as I mentioned there is a local acidity which will also influence the bioactivity and distribution of antibodies and then whatever uh, clinical clinically we are if we are giving an antibody or a drug the local acidity will definitely influence its action and this can potentially interfere with the clinical efficacy of the therapeutic antibodies including the immune checkpoint inhibitor. So therefore even if we try to target if the local environment is not conducive pertaining to the pH, the activity of the agents may be lost. So therefore, tumor acidity is the central regulator of the cancer immunity that orchestrates both local as well as systemic immunosuppression that may offer a broad panel of therapeutic targets. So one has to modulate the tumor acidity to achieve maximum benefit. So one of the driving forces that renders the tumor microenvironment is a hostile milieu 
for the anti-tumor immune cells from hypoxia and cascade of biochemical reactions leading to local acidity. So, this local acidity is actually creating a very hostile milieu for the anti-tumor immune cells. Now, how can we get rid of this acidification? The acidification of tumor microenvironment seems to protect the cells from chemotherapy. Due to an alteration of pH, partitioning at the cell membrane which results in an extracellular accumulation of the chemotherapeutic drugs. These drugs due to the acidification will not be able to enter into the cells via passive diffusion. So, how do we ensure an efficient drug delivery? To ensure an efficient drug delivery into a tumor cell in an acidic tumor microenvironment, there are several clinical trials which are proposing using combined therapies that can target both the carbonic anhydrase and the tumor cells which includes the use of acetazolamide and radiotherapy for small cell lung cancer treatment. So, people have shown that the usage of acetazolamide along with radiotherapy has helped. So, this is the clinical trial number as well as use of SLC011 and gemcitabine. So, the here the combination of SLC011 and gemcitabine can, can help in better availability of gemcitabine into the pancreatic ductal cells. So, which is actually positive for carbonic anhydrase 9. So, if a tissue is positive for carbonic anhydrase 9, the study shows that this combination of the two agents can help in effective tumor response. Similarly, combination of azitazolamide and temozolomide has been successful in malignant glioma of brain. So, this is the uh, detail of the clinical trial. So, here the investigators have proposed to study the carbonic anhydrase inhibition. The acetazolamide functions as a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor and that along with a concomitant radiochemotherapy in localized small cell cancer has been useful to uh, uh, has shown some progress and it is in the phase 1. That is, it, the overexpression of carbonic anhydrase is important and the anti-tumor effect of preclinical acetazolamide in various tumor lines including neuroendocrine tumor lines have been studied and there, there is an observed synergy which people have observed between irradiation and inhibition of carbonic anhydrases and the potential anti-tumor immune effect caused by the decreased extracellular acidity has been studied. This SLC011 is actually a uridol substi substituted benzene sulfonamide small molecular inhibitor of carbonic anhydrase 9. Just like acetazolamide, this particular small molecular inhibitor also works against carbonic anhydrase 9. The objectives of the first in human that is phase 1 study were to determine the safety and tolerability of this component, this particular small molecule inhibitor in patients with advanced solid tumors and to establish the recommended phase 2 dose for the future clinical investigation. So, this phase 1 study shows that the SLC011 was safe in patients with previously treated advanced solid tumors and the safety and the pharmacokinetic data supports 1000 mg per day as the recommended phase 2 dosage for this particular small molecular inhibitor SLC011. So, this will be able to take care of the carbonic anhydrase overexpression. Now, coming to the third aspect, avoiding the neovascularization and targeting the endothelial cells and the pericytes. Now, bevacizumab, avastin, is a very very famous molecule and bevacizumab or avastin is an antibody which targets the VEGF and this was the first anti-angiogenic agent which was approved by FDA that is already available in the clinic. The fluorescent form of avastin which is called as the bevacizumab di e 800CW has been showing promising results for its use in tumor imaging.
So bevacizumab along with this particular fluorescent dye has been useful in imaging of tumors. The tumor visualization with near infrared fluorescence which is what is called as the NIRF imaging might aid exploration and resection of the pancreatic cancer by visualizing the tumor in real time is possible if this particular agent is used along with bevacizumab. Conjugation of the near red uh, infrared uh, uh, fluorophore which is the IR dye 800 CW and this is conjugation of the near infrared fluorophore that is the IR dye 800 CW along with the monoclonal antibody bevacizumab results in enabling the targeting of the VEGF growth factor A that is VEGF A. Now if you see here these figures show how the neovascularization takes place. The tumor itself is secreting the VEGF. This VEGF will increase the number of blood vessels expression and therefore you see that new blood vessels are formed to support this particular tumor. Now bevacizumab is able to bind to the VEGF. So the VEGF which is secreted by the tumor is bound by bevacizumab which in turn prevents the formation of new blood vessels. So similarly if you see here you have the receptor the VEGF A binding to the receptor which is leading to angiogenesis. Whereas the avastin, the monoclonal antibody, uh, otherwise called as bevacizumab, raised against the VEGF A, binds to VEGF A, and therefore it is not available to bind to this receptor, which is functioning in an anti, anti angiogenic fashion. Avastin specifically inhibits the VEGF extracellularly. Now, this particular table shows the VEGF and the VEGF R, that is the uh, growth factor as well as receptor targeting therapeutic agent and the therapeutic strategy which was used and the cancers in which they were useful and this is the clinical trial reference. So I would urge the listeners to kindly go through these clinical trials. Now coming to the first trial where bevacizumab has been used and this is as we saw it is an anti-VEGF and in a, uh, this has been used in a chemotherapeutic cocktail that is bevacizumab along with 5-fluorouracil, folinic acid and panitumumab and intra-arterial versus intravenous oxaliplatin. So this combination versus oxaliplatin has been studied in colorectal neoplasms. Similarly, cisplatin with etoposide versus cisplatin, etoposide and bevacizumab. This combination has been studied in small cell lung cancer. Bevacizumab versus placebo in thyroid. Bevacizumab as a second line treatment in intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma has been done. Bevacizumab along with another anti-VEGF antibody LY01008 with carboplatin and paclitaxel versus bevacizumab with carboplatin and paclitaxel. So this or that. So along with the combination of LY01008 and bevacizumab as such has been studied in non-small cell lung cancer. Then there is another study which has been done on ovarian cancer. Here it is along with the olaparib which is a PARP inhibitor along with the sediranib which is a VEGF A inhibitor versus olaparib alone. And uh, another molecule which is a uh, uh, ramu sirumubab which is basically an anti-VEGF receptor along with paclitaxel versus placebo with paclitaxel. So this has been done in gastric adenocarcinoma. So these clinical trials can be referred to to understand the role of the anti-angiogenic reagents. Now after targeting the angiogenesis, now let us see how one can target the immune system. Now considering the role of the immune system in cancer, there are several routes that could be used to tackle the tumor progression. First one is inhibition of the macrophage recruitment into the tumors. We saw that the tumor associated macrophages get recruited. So if we could stop the inhibition, if you could stop the macrophage recruitment, it would help. Then inhibition of the macrophage differentiation into pro-tumoral phenotypes which is called as the tumor associated macrophages. So this differentiation has to be stopped. And then targeting the chronic inflammation 
or the pro tumorigenic factors which are supplied by adaptive immune cells so one needs to target the inflammation the fourth aspect is activating the anti tumoral activity we have to activate this active this particular aspect within a tumor to circumvent the risk of developing cancer or a poor prognosis of patient when a tumor is already established and this is exactly what we are doing in immunotherapy overall the macrophage targeting strategies show therapeutic efficacy nonetheless when we use it in a combination along with the conventional cytoreductive therapy like radiation and surgery or chemotherapy or along with an angiogenesis inhibitors or uh, so the uh, or immunotherapy the better research results can be achieved so overall it has to be used in combination for better results additionally the other strategies which involve targeting the macrophage recruiting mediators have been explored for example uh, the chemokines the compound the complement components the colony stimulating factor vegf so these can also together be used now let us see suppression of an anti tumor immune response is is one of the very very main mechanisms by which the tumor cells escape destruction from the immune system how does this happen now there are this myeloid derived suppressor cells what we call as the mdsc so these are your mdscs they represent the main immune suppressive cells present in the tumor micro environment that sustain cancer progression so these mdscs basically are the main players which are present within the tumor now these mdscs are nothing but a a group of immature myeloid cells with a potent activity against the t cell so these mdscs are basically myeloid cells and they have a activity very very they act against the t cells that is why you see they mainly inhibit the t cells so this inhibition has to go although no therapeutic target specifically target these mdscs they have been approved till date so as such there are no drugs which can uh, directly target these mdscs to our but there you we can use agents which can prevent their differentiation and inhibit their development infiltration or activity are being evaluated so the mdsc accumulation is mediated basically by two signals number 1 there can be high levels of uh you no know, tumor derived growth factors so you can have gm csf or m csf vegf all these you no know, the the growth factors which are released from the tumor themselves can promote expansion of these immature cells from the bone marrow and spleen and they can inhibit their terminal differentiation into macrophages dendritic cells or granulocytes so therefore there is a inhibition in their terminal differentiation secondly presence of the pro inflammatory cytokines so it is due to the tumor derived growth factors as well as pro inflammatory cytokines which are released from the tumor like interferon gamma il beta interleukin 4 interleukin 6 il 13 tnf alpha all these promote the pathological activation of these mdscs now if you see here in this cell in this cartoon now this is your mdsc here so if you can there are agents which can promote this because they are in the d differentiated state they are kind of creating an immunosuppressive environment so if we have agents which can promote their differentiation these mdscs can get differentiated into macrophages and dendritic cells by using several agents like all trans retinoic acid vitamin d3 stat3 inhibitors these can these can promote differentiation of the mdscs to macrophages and dendritic cells similarly one could have methods to deplete this population so that is done by chemotherapy using several agents like gemcitabine five fluorouracil paclitaxel doxorubicin all these chemotherapeutic drugs can bring down or deplete this population there is also a way to block the recruitment of these mdscs so these mdsc recruitment 
into the tumor microenvironment can be blocked by several agents. So we have the CCL2 antibodies, we have CXCR2 inhibitors, CCR inhibitors, several other VEGF inhibitors, then you have the amino bisphosphonate. So there are several compounds which can inhibit or which can block the recruitment of the MDSEs into the tumor microenvironment. Similarly, you have other components, the same components can also be used to inhibit the MDSEs mediated immunosuppression. So basically the T cells should be, the because these MDSEs tend to inhibit the T cells, this mechanism need to be worked into so that the T cells have to get activated. So there are several therapeutic agents that target the macrophages and the myeloid derived suppressive cells recruitment in the intervention clinical trials. Now we will see, now this is a trial, this particular uh, molecule that is the PLX3397. This is basically a CSF1 receptor inhibitor. This particular uh, compound, this agent has been found to be uh, useful in advanced solid tumors, giant cell tumors, melanoma, pancreatic and colorectal cancer, gastrointestinal stromal tumor advanced solid cancers, gastric cancers, a lot of trials are going on uh, and in several stages. These are the stages, phases of the clinical trial. So, they are all in several phases of the clinical trial uh, which is exploring this particular therapeutic agent. Similarly, there are other types of CSF inhibitor which are there, which are in clinical trials for several advanced solid tumors. Similarly, you have the tyrosine kinase inhibitor Chua uranib, which is useful, which is studied, being studied in ovarian cancer, small cell lung cancer, hepatocellular carcinoma. And then you have this particular small molecule inhibitor, which is being tried in uh, pancreatic cancer and melanoma. And then you have another, if you see, there are so many different types of uh, uh, therapeutic agents, which are basically targeting the CSF, that is colony stimulating factor 1 receptor. So, after targeting the uh, MDSEs, next we come to targeting the chronic inflammation. As we all know, any chronic inflammation is conducive to oncogenesis, conducive for a tumor formation. Inflammation is something that we always need to pay attention to. So, we all know this non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are widely used as antipyretics, analgesics, antiplatelet uh, agents. So, they uh, are uh, operating through the inhibition of the COX activity, which are your cyclooxygenases. So, one such NSAID, which is called as the aspirin, has been identified as the broad spectrum chemopreventive agent based on the data from several clinical and epidemi epidemiological study. So, if you see these come under several categories, you have the statins, the metformin, the NSAIDs and the, the anti-infection agents and several natural supplements which are coming as nutraceuticals. All these are promoting the uh, anti-inflammatory property in a TME. So, all these are known to be having some effect in bringing down the information that uh, inflammation that is your berberin, uh, sel selenium uh, and then you have the omega-3 fatty acids. So, all these come as uh, vitamin supplements, natural sub supplements and then you have the NSAIDs in the form of COX-2 inhibitors that we take. And then you have the metformin, the statins, all these are uh, in different study phases, but found to be useful in targeting chronic inflammation. Now, little bit about the mechanism of the cyclooxygenases, how these NSAIDs are able to act. So, the cyclooxygenases, they are basically two types, the COX-1 and the COX-2. These are the major targets of the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So, normally the COX can activate the AKT, the NTOR and the NF-kappa B to support cancer survival and proliferation either directly or via the production of prostaglandin E2. So, the COX in turn promote the AKT or they can also lead to production of prostaglandin E2. This prostaglandin E2 will bind to the receptor which is called as the EP4. The prostaglandin E2, which is 
produced in a cox2 dependent manner will bind to the prostaglandin e2 receptor ep4 so if you see this binds to the ep4 and it can induce intracellular signal transduction whereas the cox2 functions to down regulate the expression of dna demethylase tet1 the ep4 signaling will upregulate the dna cytosine methyl transferase 1 so they function differently the altered expression of both of these epigenetic regulators resulting result in uh, silencing the tumor suppressor genes and this in turn can promote cancer initiation which could be potentially prevented through treatment with a cox2 inhibitor and celecoxib there are several trials it's one of the well known chemo preventive agent which is used in useful in bringing down the uh, inflammation in the tumor environment there are several clinical trials which are focusing on interleukin 1 receptor antagonists so therefore uh, there is a, a particular compound called as anakindra this is called as the kindred this is an fda approved il1 receptor antagonist this is used in the second line treatment of rheumatoid arthritis but it is also showing promising results in treatment of breast cancers along with bone metastasis so there are trials which are going on similarly there is another uh, molecule called as the canakinumumab which is basically a anti il1 beta monoclonal antibody which is also commonly used for treatment of inflammatory diseases but it is showing uh, promise in reduced incidence of lung cancer in a clinical trial so all these molecules which are showing promise as a anti inflammatory agent is also showing promise as an anti cancer agent